Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co host. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. Today's episode is a two-part, part one being the balanced data slate, and part two will be coming out on Monday as usual, chatting about Gellerpox Infected and Kill Team Termination with Orion Wilfong. Here is part one, the balanced data slate. We are officially starting. We've got a balanced data slate, quarter two for 2024. Big news, everybody. Lots of changes, mm -hmm. but none of them super massive outside of i think higher tech circle which might be the easiest place to start i think there are two big ones one big oh. nerf one big buff and i think on the biggest nerf higher tech circle gotta pour one out for the homies because you can no longer living metal <laughs> after you reanimate yeah so they're gonna stand up with d3 plus two and that's just the end of it so you can stand up with five if you're lucky and you can stand up with three if you're not and that's your life now. At least you get up on a two. So it is better than the print book, but it is a massive nerf to what the higher tech circle has presented as their play style for the last three months. Yeah, I mean, it's always bringing them out injured now. Like that's not five wounds is not fun. technically injured on your dorks, but it, it's basically no, all. But yeah, it's one in three that you get them there. Yeah. Yeah, it's not great. I will say, you know, as far as silver linings, the Technomancer now has a much more obvious reason for play on no injury rolls. And if you can keep your guys alive, then you at least can res a little bit or you can have a little bit more living metal if you can survive the turn that you res. Just so uh, like, that survival rate is going to be hard at three wounds. Honestly, uh, maybe it's not a nerf at all. It's just a stealth buff to the Technomancer. <laughs> Yeah, I, at least for the last couple of months, Higher Tech Circle have lived in this spot where you could reliably reanimate and reliably get use out of your operatives. That playstyle basically gone. So I don't I kind of expect that Higher Tech Circle kind of fades the background. As far as the biggest buff, we've got Scout Squad. You know, me and Jason have been talking on our week to week stat show for Patreon and scouts have just been terrible for forever and ever and ever. Yeah, I, I haven't right. personally played them, so I have no opinions. Yep, I've played them quite a bit. I mean, I really, really wanted to love Scouts, and they just were really not it. Um, especially after playing Hernkin, like, I finally got a game in with Hernkin, and they absolutely slay. It's just, like, everything that Scouts want to do, but better. And then, like, the Forge movement doesn't even matter because the resource points get you where you need to be. And then um, just play them a little bit more. Like, the same way I played Intercessors is just park where you want to be and then just mulch people. And so Hernkin will just do that and they're fine. Um, which I guess is a little bit different than Scouts who want to sit outside of where you could ever get within six and use Stealth Relocate, which is just, you're going to lose every game if that's what you do. Yeah, Ryan, how do you feel about uh, scouts? So, yeah, the team definitely needed some help. This isn't the way I would have liked to have seen it happen. Now they're just a bunch of melee guys running around, being angry and chopping Marines down, potentially. Um, yeah. But it's a good change. It's just not the one I would have wanted to have seen. I would have, I would have preferred to see the gunners get cumbersome or something like that. Um, yeah. Something to make them a more well-rounded thing than now just like melee is pretty much the best play style for them maybe you can have a gunner back them up but i think more likely than not you're dropping gunners to take warriors in certain matchups it made them a little bit more like everybody else i think the 10 operative space has has a lot of other competitors you know felgor commandos so scout squads mm -hmm. now live in that exact same space which i guess makes sense because it was weird that they played in the nine operative space when someone like commandos get all all their toys but the melee being so good means that now there's really not a great reason to pick a bunch of heavy weapons. 
Yeah. Yeah, because the heavy <laughs> weapons, you'll probably shoot them like once per game if you're lucky. And if you bring all three, you probably won't even like shoot all three because there's not enough like sh- places to set up a shooter for three dudes with heavy weapons to be helpful, in my opinion. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. So those are probably the two biggest changes on the data slate. I think, you know, Ryan, you played Felgor a bunch. They got a reasonably large nerf, I think, but not as much as Higher Tech Circle because they're not removed from gameplay. Well, yeah. Uh, let me see here because I'm still looking. So Felgor so... Ravagers on a broad level, their wound counts are flatter. So no one has it's not three models with 11 wounds and then mm-hmm. everyone else with 10. So it's just the leader that keeps the higher wound count. And then instead of ceaseless, everyone's down to or instead of relentless, everyone's down to ceaseless, which I think is probably a nice way to make it so that the injure like the frenzied felgors are now not just massive issues because a frenzied relentless felgor was basically the bee's knees because you go in, you hit on fours and you just reroll everything. Yeah, so this one isn't that big for me, honestly. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's good because there's a lot of goats that at the 11 wound cap that would just live through certain breakpoints at one wound, which means you had like to kill them two more turns, basically, because then you'd have to frenzy them and then you have to get rid of their frenzy when they lived on one wound. Now living at 10, there's a lot more weapons that catch that breakpoint and knock them down, which is good. Um, the reckless deter- or the um, the ceaseless going down i think is fine because like they already have a source of like four relentless anyway a lot of times when i played the team i didn't even need to use some of their relentless weapons or the ploy that you can spend for because like you just had one or the other you didn't need both um and i think this one gives you more of an option to need you know to use one or the other which i like i I think that's fine like these seem pretty healthy for velgar honestly they're not like a shove them in the dirt and, you know, making them CT or anything like that. I think they just bring them in line to be a little bit more fair and a little bit more dynamic on what the employees achieved to do versus what the operatives naturally did. They're like a yeah. little bit less reliable, too. It's um, it, it, I just it seems like you're you're trapped at being more at mercy to the dice. So now they're kind of just like a stat check boogeyman uh, more than they mm-hmm. were before. Yeah, the relentless yeah, I mean, before like, still deploy to reroll everything. Like it definitely let the, the frenzied guys just kind of do whatever they needed to do on a live status or frenzied status. Uh, there is one more small nerf. Reckless determination now requires that the Felgor has moved and is not in cover. Yeah, so ultimately, oh, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah so that one is a big one. So you can't be double retaining anymore. Yeah, the double retain goes away and they'll just always get retained whether or not they're in cover. If you use reckless determination is essentially how that's going to like pan out. Yeah, mm-hmm. I do kind of expect that. That feels like a direction they're going broadly. So I kind of expect that if Mandrakes eventually do get a touch, that would be an easy spot for them to get touched as well. Just for future things that are coming down the line. So well, Felgor, you know, sense. Sorry. Broadly, Sorry. broadly, we're just bringing Felgor into a healthier space. I think personally looking at this, it feels way healthier because I did always find the weird 11 wound breakpoints to be annoying to have to have people remember. That was always a big issue. So, Meanwhile, well, and. As far as bus go, I think uh, Hearthkin Salvagers got some fairly sizable ones on the on the return for getting their faces pushed in repeatedly. That's not to say they haven't had people who have done pretty well, I think, over the last couple of months. Uh, Dylan G out in St. Louis has been pushing them pretty ho- pretty well. And I think there's a couple other regions where a couple of players have done well with Hearthkin Salvagers. So I expect that this set of changes will be pretty big. Uh, so now every single hearth and salvager, if they are within two inches of an objective marker in the resolve successful hit step of the combat, you can subtract one damage to a minimum of three. So just a flat damage mitigation buff when you're playing the points, which I think is going to be huge. And additionally, the Thane gets force field. So the first time you get hit by an attack dice for four or more damage, you just to scratch it, which as we know, historically is big game. And that's the first time once per game. Once per game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are good. I mean, the team, I feel like compared to Jaegers, especially now, right? They needed something to kind of make the choice a little bit better. And I think them having the extra durability compared to the Jaegers having the extra tricks and rerolls and stuff like that. I think this is a good way to help separate the two. Because if we didn't, like if nothing happened to the salvagers, then I think 
us as like the kill team group probably wouldn't end up picking salvagers over jaegers anymore yeah, I, f- so I thought I like that the Salvagers this. was a much more shooting focused team, whereas Hernkin Jaeger seem like a much more mid range counter punching team. Hernkin Hearthkin have not particularly been good at getting charged because they mm. don't, like they just die pretty easily. So now when they get charged, they play like their ten wounds as long as you're on an objective, because you can generally take one extra attack from four five or uh, or from four five profiles, which is like the real big break point when you're at eight wounds. Whereas Hernkin, because they have the damage mitigation for that first hit, also play at around the 10 wound breakpoint. So both of them seem like they're in a better spot. Yeah. Jason, any thoughts? Yeah, um, I mean, I was a little surprised because, I mean, all the stuff you said makes sense. um, But and and it's like a sensible way to go about it. I think it's actually probably like the most thematically satisfying change of the whole data slate. <laughs> Dwarves wow. able to take it just a little bit harder. <laughs> the force field. I don't know. I'm just like, he got a force field. That's cool. It's a vibe. <laughs> Whereas like, you know, the scouts just get an extra dude. I was like, I don't know. That's just kind of like here. I, I guess here's something. Whatever, dude. Figured out. Use the box. Use Bring the knives. whole box and a bunch of knives. Stab your space marine powered armored brethren. Buy another face. box so you can build knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just uh, full, uh, full warrior lists coming in hot. Uh, four meta. six is a juicy breakpoint for a standard dork. I think yeah. you, there's also a reroll rule baked into the equipment, right? Like you can take your four six knife to have. Some other, some other reroll or some other change. Um, yeah, so you can give them a, a paired knives or whatever, uh, extra blade, and then they just become balanced. So it just balanced. takes four warriors with balanced knives, and your hunter gets a balanced knife, and then uh, everybody else just kind of dorks around and grabs points. <laughs> yeah, that seems pretty good. Uh, you know, returning back to the nerf side, we've got blooded one teeny tiny nerf, <laughs> bringing the big boy in line with other big boys. So now the trader Ogren can only use heavy terrain or big operatives to get cover, which I think is a an interesting nerf because I don't know if blooded win rate was actually high enough to really need this. But it is kind of like a standardization thing, which I find appealing from a rules perspective. Like now all of the big guys outside of higher tech circle, interestingly enough, have this rule of you can't use small guys for cover and you can't use light cover as light cover. For for hiding, they're just too big. How do we feel about this? Yeah, it really felt like the Ogren was just like standing around doing nothing, and then he just like got clipped by a piece of falling debris from an airplane that exploded in the sky. He's just like minding his own business. Boom, nerf on the Ogren. Yeah, I mean, it it doesn't make. I don't really think it moves the needle too much for blooded at all. I don't think everyone saw this was like, oh my god, blooded are in the bin now. We're never playing these guys. Um, I, I think it makes sense, especially like if you look at Nightmare Hawks and stuff like that, um, who don't get the same. Group. I think it's good to see big base equals no cover, except for higher tick. But I mean, hey, they're they're hurting enough. I think we can leave them alone. Yeah. I don't think we need their hit higher tech right now while they're down. <laughs> you know, no, fuck it. Give them that too. Next day to slate. <laughs> Just keep taking them down. I mean, if we took them down, maybe they'd get some of it back in response. But yeah, maybe not right now. Maybe it's a little bit too fresh. Uh, I don't. Oh, actually, and then uh, returning back to the buffs, we've got a big one for our Space Marines, our Chaos Space Marine Bros. Legionaries finally have the roster they've always wanted, where you can take all four marks, but you only are restricted on the play field. So I know that Nova had a little bit of discussion around this, because this is the rule that they're going with at Nova for uncapped rosters. But now we've got it at least for Legionary in the meantime, so we can test it. So is it a whole new world? (laughs) I think it is. I think this is huge. Um, I do play Legionaries quite a bit. um, And it's everything. It it takes everything out of me not to take them to tournaments because elites are just really bad. But I love them. And this is a huge one for me because now um, there's a lot of ways to beat Legionaries, but you have to pick the appropriate tools for the mark. And now you have to play a guessing game of what is my opponent going to put on the table? Uh, So it's like, oh, uh, I'm not going to bring these AP weapons because, you know, he's just taking Nurgle or, he, or he's taking, you know, Zinch. So I don't want to run into those four pinballs and all of a sudden, boom, he took, you know, full corn. And it's like, well, I didn't take all the AP weapons I should have. Um, 
for you. You know, you, you're expecting to see the stock and standard Nurgle, and then somebody surprises you with God knows how many marks because you don't you don't care. There could be a, a ton on your list. I think it really shakes it up, and it will catch people off guard because they don't know what you're going to put on the table. Yeah, I think Legionary's biggest strength is their flexibility. Um, and the fact that they didn't have as much flexibility as they should kind of was making them fall behind. So this is definitely going to help with that. Yeah, I think that this is going to be a big change. I will say that this now brings Legionary back into range as one of the few teams where the 20-man roster becomes very important once again. Yeah. So it's... having the roster to hand out to your opponent actually does matter. Because if they catch you and you did something wrong, technically when you're using rosters, that is a big cheat. You you should get dinged pretty hard. And it does matter a lot now because with only 20 roster operatives and six people on the team, if you wanted to take full full mono lists, you can't necessarily do it. So you've got to make some choices. Are there any particular operatives that you want to call out as things that you haven't been able to take because Nurgle or Corn or whatever have been in the lay of the land. I know that in the past, Slanesh Shrive Talons have existed on the edges of counterplay for Gellerpox, but I'm sure there you have some other stuff in mind. Well, for me, so I love Nurgle, right? Um, Nurgle is like one of my favorite things. <laughs> I don't play Nurgle Legionaries. Fuck them. I hate them. Their diet, their diet Nurgle, they don't care. Um, so what I always play is Ancient Slanesh when I play Legionaries, and I have a really good track record with it. Um, I think it's just because I have a ton of fun and nobody knows what's going on. But, uh, so this opens it up more along the lines for me to use Nurgle here and there if I wanted to. Um, like, there is a case for Nurgle Anointed. He's just tanky. Or, you know, occasionally a Nurgle Gunner to remove AP, or to remove a, a defense dice from somebody if I really wanted to. Um, Corn I've never used, but now maybe I could. You know, on Into the Dark, there are is niche scenarios for the one corn melee specialist who's just gonna ping pong through everybody and rip through. And I never had that before, so now maybe I could. I mean, the the world is the legionaries' oyster. This data slate. The world is the legionaries' eaters. <laughs> Because Jason is a world eaters player. He went well. trying to play a full corn for like two years in the background mm. of the podcast. Um, it's super fun, honestly. It's mm. not amazing, but it is really fun. It's better I than think, it looks. Yeah, tactical nuclear violence is is a strategy that is now available to to legionary, which they really couldn't do before. Because I think corn, if you took them, you just locked yourself out of a little bit too much. As far mm -hmm. as like Slanesh just gives you more ability to play objectives and do all this other stuff that is safe, which is important. But sometimes, you know, against something like Star Striders, three corn operatives just, nope, suddenly the team is dead because they're trying to stage mid-board objectives. And now your chainsword wielding berserker is ping pong through three guys, which has happened to good players. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Sometimes you can't get away from it on End of the Dark. You know, back to uh, Nerf land. I think this one, Ryan, you're probably very happy with because I know you hate Pathfinders just like everybody else <laughs> in the world. <laughs> no. To be fair, as a Pathfinder player, I was very surprised at, you know, where they were allowed to be for the last couple months. I have thought that they were extremely good. So Pathfinders have eaten two pretty substantial, actually three substantial nerfs. So now the recon drone is only giving you balanced. So before it was full relentless, which meant that an ion rifle could just shoot with five dice on fours with relentless on turn one, which was very rough when you could do five, six AP one damage with hot recon sweep can no longer be used on turning point one, not really killing the ability for you to use a turn one grenade ploy, but really locking it off of hitting your opponent's drop zone, at least on the standard three inch deployment boards. And then on specifically Beta Decima, your drone can no longer deploy six inches forward. It's got to be wholly within four inches. Yes. Oh, and now the drone has been standardized to use the same forward deploy mechanic on In the Dark as everyone else. Because I don't know if anyone didn't know this, but for the longest time since the first World Championships, Pathfinders have been allowed to forward deploy a drone into a locked room. That is no longer the case. The drone is now doing a normal move and an operate hatch, just like everyone else, which doesn't super matter as far as, a, a, you know, actually using the models. But it does mean that they are more restricted on where they can be in the rooms, because before you could like leave a drone in a corner and have it overwatch a room. Now it's got to move into the room like everybody else. 
So three reasonably sizable nerfs to Pathfinders. Yeah, I don't think but it I like, don't... butchers them or anything. Yeah. I, the recon well, sweep on it... turn one definitely hurts them, but I, I think, think it's okay for I that think to that's hurt the them. biggest hurt, but that is like other teams had a similar vibe where it was like you can't do your immediate dash on turn one. Like Scouts and Caster Kitten have the same thing going on. Yeah, I mean, I think the recon drone one is pretty serious. As somebody who has watched a Hulk get murdered through that, um, man, I, you never you never hate the recon drone more than when you see a normal guy take a Hulk down to one wounds when he just, yeah, because he rerolled everything. Um, yeah, so I'm happy about that. Now it's one dice. Care. It makes the ions a little worse because you can only reroll one instead of potentially all if you whiffed. Uh, yeah, I like to be it. fair, you can still do the prep work where it's still good. Like rerolling once plus a marker light is still rerolling twice. And on a rail rifle hitting on fours, it's basically as good as relentless in most cases. And then on an ion rifle, it's a little bit worse, but at least you can remove the ones from the equation. This really does force Pathfinder players to really set up marker lights again, which is good. Uh, and on In the Dark, they didn't need the ability to do the two operative play that is just dominating a room, which is what the Ion Rifle plus a Recon Drone was quite good at. Yeah. It does also uh, hurt the Fusion Grenade play on turn one, but that's fine for that to get hurt. I don't think anyone is going to cry. Well, I think people will. I think there's a lot of Pathfinder players out there that really like taking this team, not so much because it's their favorite team, just because... The amount of ability and pressure you can put on your opponent turn one and catch a lot of people who weren't quite prepared for the team. Turn one, you just throw fusion grenades and stuff like that, and you really hurt people. I think now with a lot of these nerfs, you have to really put the time in and put the effort in to get your buffs rather than just kind of cheesing some wins. And I think that's going to take some of the players who are just playing them to cheese people out of the game more so to uh, take them out of the equation. And keep the Pathfinder players who like playing Pathfinders for the technical market like play and stuff like that. It's going to keep them in. Yeah, I feel like as long as Octarius kind of we move to a more visibility allowed map like spread, I think then Pathfinders will be fine because now they just have to set up marker lights. It's just hard when everything is fully line of sight blocking, which is kind of where things are right now. Who knows if new terrain comes out or maybe the Bandua terrain. <laughs> The world, the world team championship terrain actually does encourage a little bit more visibility, which is good for Pathfinders. So that's a pretty big change. I think it's a good one because I do think Pathfinders were probably a little overbearing, especially on for some players because it's just a lot of pressure on turn one. Now, you are probably one of the most longest veterans for Pathfinders, I think, that I know. Um, how, how do you feel with these changes overall? Do you think it's still like a tournament winning team? You think maybe this knocks it down more to like a conditional like range? How do you feel overall about the team's performance with this? I think this seem like fair, fair enough changes to me. I think the big changes are like Pathfinders really do live and die by if you can set up marker lights at all on turn one. If you play on maps where people can stage for all the midboard objectives while staying fully out of line of sight or staying out of full visibility, which is possible on some boards you know, in different regions, then it doesn't really matter. Like, you're going to lose those matches anyways because you can't set up marker lights. So on boards with a little bit more visibility permission, then I think they'll be in a good spot still. Like, the recon drone hurts, but I also thought giving them back the recon drone was insane. So I think I, yeah. I felt like the recon drone probably needed a nerf anyways. Maybe it goes back up to something like Ceaseless, which could be a nice way to give the mid-ground between balanced and the other stuff. But two rerolls with a marker light, and a recon drone is perfectly fine by my book, especially because if you are taking those shots on turn one, you're hoping to be hitting on threes. And then it really is basically just relentless. It just takes it takes a little bit more setup. My opinion was my opinion is that if all the boards end up being all heavy all the time, then Pathfinders will still remain a little bit hard. But if there are mid board objectives that are a little bit riskier that require you to use light terrain somewhere, then Pathfinders will be in a spot where they can do the thing they need to. And then you take the risk on getting hit by melee. We're not. But we'll see. That's like a board. That's like a board thing. I think at like the World Team Championship, for example, Pathfinders will be a very good choice because some of those boards have mid board objectives that are more open and require you to take risks to try to stage. And if you have to take risks to stage for visibility, then Pathfinders will be in a good spot. If you can do it safely and you can have melee operatives that can triple kill stuff, hitting, hiding behind a wall, 
and the Pathfinder player is forced to take a recon sweep or take a Montcaw to just prep marker lights, then I don't think it'll matter because all of your dudes are bunched up in weird spots. And it's not great. But outside of Pathfinders, we've got the Exaction Squad with two, one change, <laughs> one small change. Uh, I think on terminal two. or two. Okay, so terminal decree is their old reroll ploy which says or actually i don't even i might be wrong on this one let me look, take a look but terminal decree got a change oh and jason was, if you have a cheat I'm, up you can talk about yeah, it. i'm not like the most familiar but um my guy lee uh summarized it very very well and i feel like i should just go read his comment if i can find it um yeah it's pretty much um i think their gunner always gets a re-roll is one of the takeaways if i can find this and um what did I write in my notes? Uh, this is, uh, oh, I was this one totally is the, wrong in my first take. So this is balanced within four inches, but gunners are now just balanced, which should help Exaction Squad punch up against the elites, which has always been their rough spot, is that their gunners kind of suck. Yeah. And Dispense Justice now is reroll one type. Instead of just one die. Yeah. Which does, which is interesting. You know, the shields have always been the sticking point. So four dice on fours. If you match dice, now you're getting two rerolls instead of one. That is basically a flat upgrade. And it'll be an upgrade enough of the time. Because out of those two dice, one, twos, and threes, if you ever get a dupe, which happens a reasonable amount of times, you get to reroll both of them. And if you miss like three or four dice, their chances of hitting a pair somewhere in there is probably much higher. Yeah. Gives them overall quite a bit more consistency. Yeah, and then the gunners having a reroll at, at any distance instead of just within four is actually, I think, pretty a pretty big deal. I think this also I, layer, layers in with their old change that gave you P1 on the gun. So now, like, your guys in the background who are shooting into melee when the guys are getting trapped up, now you get P1 and a reroll. So gives you gives you some room for your 4-6 grenade launcher to actually do something. Yeah, full disclosure, I have never in my life played against Exaction Squad, as many games as I have played. <laughs> um, so I have no idea if these are good, if they're bad, if it moves the needle that much for Exaction players, all two of them. Like, I hope they're happy with it. Yeah, you know, not too many players want to keep playing them, but I do know there's at least one guy in the UK that's probably excited, Ryan Slater from... Yeah. Turning Point Tactics, I think he's taken Exaction Squad to like almost every tournament this year. I think trying to push trying to push them basically. And he's done reasonably well. He makes it in the top eight pretty regularly. He does he does well. It's just the reliability is just not there on the shields. Like I think famously at LVO when I was or not famously, but like at LVO when I was talking to him, he's like, You can have a Felgor and a shield guy go into melee. There's literally no way to predict what happens at the end of any of the combats. So this should help. You know, the the reroll any one type should definitely push the needle a little bit whether it's enough compared to something like scouts who just got a whole extra operative probably not but i don't know if exaction squad need a jillion more buffs or this is enough to kind of push them all the way over the edge i think unless you did something innately to make them busted um i think they're just in the space of needing a design rework much like warp coven uh where like the team itself no matter how many buffs you give it it doesn't function properly and you'll just need it to be redesigned at a later point, probably if like we get a new edition or stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, you have to find a way to play them as security and just set up a bulwark. It's just that currently, I think actually a big part of the current duckness of the meta is that we're playing a very flat 3-3 uh, three, three split on all of our open mats. So a lot of the times people are just taking safe plays and there's no reason to take risky plays ever because you can guarantee almost a flat split on the board and then you push up where it makes sense rather than having a couple more mid board objectives where people are forced to interact with each other you can play less committal responses more regularly at least that's that's kind of my my feeling right now because security was really good when we when things first dropped and it has become substantially less so probably because now you have you can you can't really like hide or like you can't you don't play the middle of the board as active. Well, I think the other problem with it was it used to be really good because you could score some of the stuff turn one. And when crit ops change, now everything is you have three turns to score your attack ops now. That's where everyone else pretty much has four opportunities to score them. Yeah. Yeah. I think is that everything? 
There's actually uh, uh, everything that's all the, that's all the changes. Um, I did want to highlight that Kasserkin got nothing. Um, so they're just hanging out down in the dumps with their bad win rate and no buffs. So R.I.P. Kasserkin. All right, hold on now, because if we're going to go that route, uh, we got to dig an even deeper grave for crew. Come on now. We, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> they're objectively like the worst performing and they they're like, no, we don't want to see crew and kill team actually. They, they have, have like 40K a handful of players, you know, like in Texas, they've got a hat like Alexander Salazar. He did, he did pretty well with them. Like he's he's he winning did. in Texas. And it was a criminal that ticket. he didn't get to play top. But was the I, you got cut off a little bit at the end, Ryan? No, oh, so he got it was criminal that he didn't get to play in the top cut, um, yeah. even though he had objectively better records. than. I don't I don't love bracket top. systems. <laughs> I, I'm like, you know, I've watched KTO and I watched Dallas. I don't love the bracket cuts because I, I feel I like it either. punishes. It punishes an early loss a little bit too hard. So. Well, I mean, you say that, but like Mike Cortez took an early loss and he still made it in. It is True. doable. It's incredibly challenging. But yeah. overall, I don't favor bracket systems. LVO okay. did it the best, in my opinion. That's that's how I like I think it. Once we get to a spot where people have to play or people can't play everything, then fine. We maybe can go to bracket systems. But I think right now the game is still pretty small. Like let people just play <laughs> is kind of where I'm at. I like seeing anything happening, you know, like yeah. uh, that group guy could have taken a second. Um, by all means, if he wasn't locked into a bracket, uh, could have taken first. Who the fuck knows? Um, yeah, 7-1. Seven, 7-1 one. Seven, one is a... Uh... Well, he was 7-1, right? He was 6-1? He was 7-1, but there was a chance, I think, that the top table could have also been X1s. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a chance that that could happen. Yeah. I mean, you know, talking about big tournament runs, I think this last weekend in uh, Goonhammer... It, we had three a uh, three way tie on record where they were all five and one in the six round Goonhammer UK Open split, and they used strength of your opponent score as the secondary tiebreaker. So it was not overall victory points. They used were your opponents the best opponents, and it ended up being a three way tie for just pure win rate, which is kind of crazy because I think generally there's this this concept in Warhammer 40k where people talk about submarining and this was definitely one where someone basically submarine got right up to the top slot and then won the last game in a mirror and that kind of decided the tournament how are we feeling about those sorts of bracket decisions so I mean so what, what was the issue here specifically was it the opponent's strength of schedule was the issue or so the way their secondary tiebreakers are, if you played better opponents, opponents who won more, you mm -hmm. would effectively get a better tiebreaker. And the final tiebreaker was, I think, 3% delta <laughs> between first place and third place or second place. And then third place basically had a 58% uh, opponent win rate. So basically that tiebreaker says all his opponents didn't do as well as number one and number two. So number two, it was entirely his tournament to lose because he was the 5-0 going into the last round. But the submarine player, basically, if he beat number two, that obviously number two had some of the best tiebreakers because he beat everyone else. And that basically sealed the deal, which is kind of cool and also kind of tilting i, I assume so there's I mean, a you want to you want to go ahead. first orion i oh, know go ahead i would love to hear um so adepticon did something similar with uh, the opponent's win percent was a, a big factor and then from somebody who got uh knocked out of the top cut by that was only because um so like i didn't make top cut because like opponents dropping and then that made my opponent win percent go down. And then because of that, I didn't make the top cut. Um, so it does have flaws, and I've felt it personally. Adepticon also gets a little trickier because you have the brackets within bracket system uh, for like day two, where like I had the highest points in the top bracket of every category, but I still got placed in fourth just because I lost my first match day two. Even though I had, I think, like 20 or so more victory points than the lead, I had the highest strength of schedule and stuff like that, but I was still capped at fourth. So like, I'm not a big fan of how GW does their organization because it doesn't, once you reach day two, everything you've done previously means nothing. It's just win or lose, and that's it. Um, it is just a hard reset, yeah, when you do bracket systems. So you have to like fully reset where your headspace is at. This is something that Magic the Gathering does for Pro Tours. Like if you make it into day two, you reset into like a new format entirely. So Kill Team 
for GW events, I guess, is kind of moving in that direction. It does feel like a lot of the moves they're making for the larger organizational stuff is mimicking past in-person games and how those things are being structured. Like the current Pro Tour and Magic the Gathering is kind of like how the World Championships of Warhammer is set up to bring people in all the way around the world to play against each other. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of like how the world's did it, though, where they have the separate, like, losers bracket, where it's like, hey, well, you're not quite out of the thing. Like, if you made it to day two and you immediately lost, like, there was still a chance you could bring it back, opposed to, or just like, well, you lost round one, so thanks for playing, you know, eight rounds previously. Uh, you know, go have fun in the kiddie pool. It, it's not my favorite. I, I really enjoyed LVO specifically, um, like, looking at Adrian Bonaventa's win, right? Because... Um, him like winning that meant anything could happen that at any point in time no one was safe in the ground and we played three like days of kill team and i thought that was a crazy thing to see right because like, oh who's gonna win who's gonna take it who's gonna take this you know oh my god this guy lost you know it Actually, was, it was that one was a crazy tournament because every single result mattered like there was no like jason out here over here tying vivek on intercession mm -hmm. versus vet guard actually did help adrian just barely eke over the top because if vivek had a win there then vivek would have won <laughs> right yeah, yeah, it was LVO a really was, wild. LVO was amazing. Um, is like I like to call that turn uh, that format the mulching pit because it's just like you're, yeah, it, it is like every single result matters, and there's like there's more games than there needs to be, but like not really, um, because it like it really highlights you know the the true champion. I feel like yeah, yeah I, I mean if you're exciting. going for if you're going for a competitive event, I think everything you should do should be a reflection of your win. Yeah. Rather than just, you know, I mean, I, I could talk about this for hours, but that's not necessarily the point of this. <laughs> okay. And that is where we're going to wrap it up for today. Uh, stay tuned next Monday to hear the rest of the conversation with Orion Wilfong. 